English translation, fifth contact, Sunday, 16th of February, 1975, 2341Rs. We have noticed that you are already trying to publicize our cause much faster than we had actually planned to. Nevertheless, we are glad about that, and we have nothing against your rush. But it might have been better if you had still waited some time. It seemed to me that I could already do the hard preparatory work, since this one certainly takes a lot of effort. That is certainly true, because everything will not be very easy. Fundamentally speaking, we have also nothing against it, because we want to leave everything to your own decision. Thanks. The trust of you and yours honors me. However, do you not expect somewhat too much of a good thing from me? You have a healthy sense of humor. Do you think so? Sure, because truthfully, one can never really have too much confidence in you, because you always give your best and try to make the best of everything you approach. You flatter me. Certainly not, because it is just the truth. Already enough, Sim Yase, because certainly you did not come here, so that we grapple with flatteries and the like. You are right, because just today I would like to tell you something that will not only interest you, but all human beings. It is a somewhat strange story, which will, however, stir up a lot of dust due to the interest of the human beings, because it sounds too fantastic for all those who have not yet discovered or developed their spiritual conscious-based thinking. Unfortunately, intellectual greatness is not enough to be able to grasp this story. But especially intellectual human beings are in abundance on the earth, and of all people, they are often the ones who lack spiritual consciousness-based knowledge, and who are therefore unable to muster understanding for the real and for the logic. However, in this context also those are to be mentioned, who are led into the unreal by religions, and those who have made neither intellectual nor spiritual consciousness-based far progress. All of them are the most evil opponents of the truth, the real and the irrefutable creational logic. But their criticism and their denial of certain things distinguish them, as human beings living in primitive foolishness. Earth humans who always claim to know everything better, but who are in truth more unknowing than the ape beings that populate your primeval forests. By the denial of facts or possibilities, they openly expose their consciousness-based limitedness and their primitivity. Those are very hard words, Simyase, even though in my opinion they correspond to the full sad truth. Exactly, and you know that this is really so... And that this is, in fact, the case is proved by you yourself in your book, which you have dressed in even harder words. Of course, because the truth can only be said in hard words, as diplomacy would be pure lie and would trivialize everything. Of course, you just have to ensure that you can make that understandable to the human beings. They have indeed already been weakened too much and become addicted to unreality, to still be able to recognize and digest honest undiplomacy as truth. They have become weak and stunted in the thinking, acting, and speaking, so that they rebel and defend themselves against everything that sounds like hard truth. But the truth can only be spread through firmness, just as peace can only be enforced through naked ga vault sam aga vault lo's ik kite. I know, unfortunately. But you told me something about a story you want to tell me today. What then is this story supposed to be? Does it have something to do with the human being, or is it simply an unimportant story? I will let you decide about that, as well as all those to whom you will pass on this story. So it is supposed to be some kind of history of the humankind? Sure. Well, then I am curious, because I have thought about this a lot during all my lifetime. I know, and you have found the truth or the approximate truth in many things. Of course, not all events and dates are precisely known to us, but we are largely informed about this. But listen to the story. Your earthly calculation of time is not very accurate, and it is only partly directed according to the facts. 
Your own calculations are not exactly correct either, but they are the most accurate ones ever calculated by a human being on the Earth. Your calculations vary only by the trifle of about 200 years, while the calculations of your scientists and researchers show faulty times in the order of several thousand years. A fact that you can recalculate at any time based on my information that I will give you here. Many researchers of the Earth have been trying since ever to calculate the exact time of the flood known to you through the Bible, but so far without any noteworthy success. Indeed, according to today's Christian calendar, the flood took place exactly 10,079 years ago. It was triggered by a worldwide catastrophe of cosmic origin when a gigantic comet threw the Earth out of its orbit and changed its period and direction of rotation. At that time, one Earth day amounted to more than 40 hours, and the sun did not rise in the east like it does today. Such changes in rotation time and direction of rotation have afflicted the Earth two more times after the flood, but they have not brought such devastating catastrophes as with the mentioned flood. The last radical change of this kind took place 3,500 years ago, of which, however, I will still speak later. The flood 10,079 years ago, related to the year 1975, was caused by a gigantic comet, which has already caused a lot of damage and has been traversing the universe since time immemorial. We call it the Destroyer, and we know that it has already been racing through outer space for millions of years. According to your calculation of time, this dangerous comet has an orbital period of 575-12 years, and in the year 2255 of your calculation of time, it will again enter the realm of the Earth in a very dangerous way, unless its orbit is changed or even destroyed by some cosmic circumstances or by our planned efforts. The last passage of this comet took place 295 years ago calculated from 1975, namely in the year 1680. 10,079 years ago, this giant comet, which had originated from a natural cosmic catastrophe, got very close to the realm of the Earth and almost destroyed it. Only the knowledge and ability of our ancestors, who had settled on the earth and had begotten their descendants here, prevented the terrible end. Also, in the following millennia, the giant comet has always been a great threat to the earth, and it will remain so too until one day it will be destroyed or diverted away. The last major catastrophe that emanated from this comet was about 3,500 years ago, as I have already mentioned. To be precise, it was 3,453 years ago, according to your calculation of time. Due to this comet, an event took place, which is very rare in the universe, namely a planetary transplantation by the monstrous gavault of this giant comet, a planet. Just developing life in a very distant planet system of the Soel system was flung out of its orbit and driven out into the outer space in a trajectory parallel to that of the destructive giant comet. For more than 130 years, this planet then trailed far behind the giant and deviated only infinitely slowly from its path. Then, 3,453 years ago, the destroyer penetrated the terrestrial solar system and brought the planetary orbits into disorder by its gigantic forces. Passing close to Earth, it enshrouded ladder in its huge tail and shook it very hard. Immense storms and volcanic eruptions were the result. Human beings and animals died in large masses, mountains were shifted and the ocean depths changed. In the Mediterranean Sea, the magma walls of the Santorini volcano were torn to pieces deep down and large quantities of water penetrated. This caused an immense catastrophe since the volcano exploded thereby and destroyed the island. The explosion created a gigantic storm surge, which grew nearly 200 meters high into the sky and swept over the sea like a primeval monster. 
Everything in it was killed and crushed, and the water turned blood red. In Egypt, this storm surge flooded vast areas and caused all sorts of epidemics. While the tidal wave receded and continued racing northeast across the sea to destroy vast areas and all port cities on the eastern shore of the sea in present-day Syria, the comet, however, shot through the terrestrial solar system and raced around the sun again, off into the outer space to return in 575, one two years. But the slower following planet. Carried along in its wake, which was about the same size as the Earth, shot past the Earth at a distance of about 600,000 kilometers, and was captured by the attraction force of the Sun. By its tremendous power, it forced the new planet into an orbit between its closest satellites, namely between Mercury and the Earth. And since then, this transplanted and immigrated planet has been known to the Earth humans, and she or he calls it Venus. Fantastic, Simyase. Sure, but I am not finished yet, because I want to tell you even more primordial things now. The prehistory of this comet so fateful for the Earth, which also brought the satellite, the Moon, over here. The fragment of a small planet from a very distant solar system. The Earth's moon, which originates from a small planet 4.5 million years older than the Earth, it was millions of years ago. Deep in the unknown space, in a space-time shifted solar system of the Milky Way, a solitary star floated far away from the normal orbits of the satellites orbiting the Sun. It was a dark star, devoid of any life, very dangerous in its unpredictable path, into which it had been flung by an immense eruption of its original sun. This was when its original sun burst through all shaking explosions, and in its destruction, partially destroyed the satellites orbiting it, or hurled them as dangerous projectiles into the dark space. The sun itself then collapsed into itself and tore a hole in the outer space. Its material pressed itself together with monstrous gay vault, and was compressed into a small mass. While the sun in its normal pulsating state had a diameter of 11 million kilometers, it now shrank down to a concentration of only 4.2 kilometers. As a result, the material was compressed in such a way that a single cubic centimeter weighed several thousand tons. Since then it has hovered in space as a dark, gaping hollow, which tears everything within millions of kilometers of its perimeter into itself, whatever it is capable of seizing, and what falls under its spell. The dark star, which got flung away by it at that time, got caught again in a neighboring solar system and orbited it in an unpredictable path. In the field of the force of the huge sun, it orbited the sun's satellites for many millennia, as well as the sun itself, testifying to the fact that it would sometime cause a catastrophe to fall upon the system. Yet still far away from the actual worlds, the dark planet, bare of any life, roamed through space. Powerfully and unapproachably, it drifted through the icy cold of the universe as an outcast, as a wandering planet, as a stranger in a foreign system, dark, dangerous, and deadly. Within the hold of the far, outstretched force arms of the sun, it came closer and closer over the course of thousands of years to the actual area of the system of satellites, which it had already been orbiting for such a long time at an ever-increasing speed. Imperceptibly, however, its course always became narrower and narrower, and year by year the extent of its danger grew. After the thousands of years, it then rushed suddenly and unexpectedly into the closest sphere of influence of the sun and its planets. Like a greedy monster, it emerged from the blackness of the universe and announced deadly destruction. Initially, it was only like a silhouette out of nowhere, but then it was recognized in a hazy and blurred way as a half-dark round disk. Now already illuminated by the reflecting rays of the sun, it approached the orbit of the outermost planet at tremendous speed. 
but it was still millions of units away from the actual hearth of the peaceful calm, which, though due to its gigantic size, it soon had to transform into a seething hell once it penetrated into the silence of this harmony. But still some time went by at first, until the giant finally strayed from his path and had moved into the most dangerous proximity. Now already recognizable as a round sphere, the destroyer reflected the sunlight while dragging a fine veil of luminous particles behind it. Still only a few hundred units away from the next worlds, it evoked hellish storms in these, which destroyed large areas that had been cultivated by the human beings peacefully emerging there. With trembling for their arduously gained goods and their already hard lives, they suddenly found themselves exposed to the immense and uncompassionate forces of the universe. Helpless, doomed to be handed over from life to death, they stared out into the sky to the gigantic wandering planet which raced towards them as a cosmic mortal projectile. It was no more than a question of time before the forces of the cosmos had to unfold their monstrous powers. On the night of the third day after the incursion of the destroyer into the planetary pathways, the middle of the night may just have passed, the drifter from outer space entered the elliptical orbit of the sixth planet. Causing immense cosmic storms, it flung the planet belonging to the orbit a few units off its direction and brought it on a dangerous course towards the sun. Monstrous eruptions and storms tore apart the peaceful appearance of the planet thriving in its magnificence. Letting mountains collapse and casting seas out of their beds, it sought a new path around its sun for itself. Full of horror and consternation over the immense forces of nature, the human beings fled into the vast plains that covered the planet in great numbers. But the unleashed forces of nature were stronger than the will and the saving idea of the human beings. Two-thirds of the humankind that inhabited the planet was killed and destroyed in the unleashed hell of nature. Wild waters tore away large parts of the mainland, while exploding volcanoes buried vast areas beneath glowing lava and turned them to rubble and ashes. The planet's daily rotation time doubled, and it circumnavigated the sun in the opposite direction. Forced by cosmic determinations, the survivors had to find a new beginning, devoid of any culture, set back to a primordial time of the development. The destroyer, however, continued racing through the system, spreading hell, death, and destruction. It crossed the path of the fifth planet, a world that was about to give birth to first life. Fortunately, at the time of the event, the latter was too far away from the point of crossing its orbital path to be seriously affected. Apart from mighty storms and minor quakes on land and at sea, there were no notable incidents on it. The fourth satellite of the system, however, would find its destruction in the Battle of the Worlds. As the smallest of all satellites, it stoically traversed its orbit, and from the perspective of anticipatory calculations, it had to cross the flight path of the wanderer exactly when facing it head-on. And that is exactly what happened. It got into the irresistible destructive power of the giant. Like two wild monsters, the two planets raced towards each other, a giant and a dwarf. But before both of them could collide, immense explosions tore the lifeless dead dwarf planet apart. Its fragments were hurled out into the endless expanses of outer space, where they were captured as shooting stars or meteors by the forces of other stars and, burning up in their atmospheres, found their final end. Further parts of the dwarf were torn into the sun and were atomized. Other parts were torn into the destroyer and became there a part of itself. As if hurled by a giant's fist, one half of the dwarf planet shot away and through, a dimensional gate created by the hands of highly developed human beings into the unending expanses of the Milky Way's space towards a very distant target. Several times on its path it got into the realm of suns and planets, 
was shaken, was hit by meteors and shooting stars and thereby changed its shape. Already after a few centuries it had reached an angular, roundish shape. It was dead and barren, however, covered by many small as well as huge, deep craters, and was incapable of supporting life. By the forces of various systems, its speed was gradually slowed down, and it changed its course several times, until one day it was attracted by the sun of a system and broke into its sphere of influence. As dark, dead planet, it traversed all planetary orbits of the outer rings without causing any damage. It was not until the inner rings that it collided with some fragments of a destroyed planet, which nevertheless only tore deep craters into it. However, this caused its course to change once again slightly, with the result that it was driven parallel to the orbit of the second planet, which was already creating its first primitive life. A planet covered by large seas and dense primeval forests, primordial, deadly, and yet gruesomely fantastic. From this point in time, only thirty-four days were still to pass before the dwarf caught up with the planet, namely the Earth, and was held captive by it. The forces of the planet were sufficient to bind the dwarf to itself and let it circle around itself as a new satellite on an ever-changing elliptical path. Since then it has orbited the Earth as moon, 4.5 million years older than its mother celestial body. In the distant solar system, however, the destroyer continued to rage. Destroying everything in its path, it flung the planet closest to the sun with unimaginable force towards the sun, in front of which it destroyed itself at a millionfold distance by immense eruptions and fell into the sun as smallest fragments and atomized. The destroyer itself drifted by a few units from its old course and shot past the sun in dangerous proximity back into the expanses of the space. In order to take the same path as long times before the small planet did, consequently it also passed the dimension gate created by technically highly advanced human beings' hands and came into the space-time configuration of our Dern universe and into the area of the Milky Way and thus also into the Sol system. But due to the unimaginable heat of the blazing sun, the surface of the dangerous wanderer liquefied and the glowing substances and particles flung away by its racing speed created behind it a shining tail hundreds of thousands of units long, shining as bright as the destroyer planet itself, which had now become deadly comet. Due to the zero cold of the universe, the surface of the wanderer quickly solidified again, but its illuminating power remained with it, as did the shining tail. Myriads and myriads upon myriads of smallest particles and substances have covered it ever since, inundating it and following it as long tail when it comes into the realm of a sun, shining and showing the beings of the universe the path of the comet. Due to the continuous sequence of meteor dust, particles, substances, and the crepuscular radiation of the suns, it will never lose its illuminating power again until one day it will fall victim to its destruction. It will still wander through space for thousands or further millions of years before it itself has turned into dust by the grinding particles or is captured and destroyed by a sun. But perhaps one day, human beings will also destroy it, just as it has already destroyed milliard-fold lives. Millions of years have already elapsed since its emerging, and its course is still unpredictable. Due to all sorts of cosmic forces, it often changes its course in the S.O.L. system quite unexpectedly, and endangers, among others, its unfinished solar systems of Jupiter and Saturn, but by and large, its dangerous path is that stable that it passes through the same planetary systems again and again over the course of 575, one, two years, albeit with variations in the distance of up to one million kilometers. The humankind of the distant solar system, two-thirds of which were destroyed at that time, found a new beginning which was hard and full of privation. 
Nevertheless, in less than nine centuries, the human beings built up a new civilization and culture, created and driven out of the hardship arising from cosmic forces. The people succeeded in preventing further cosmic catastrophes and annihilations. Through arduous research, work, and voluntary commitment to the very last one, they created plans for their new culture and for a far-reaching technology. Dwellings were built that could withstand the gay vault of nature, and generation after generation brought together their knowledge and skills. Their spirit and their consciousness and their knowledge refined themselves rapidly, and soon the succeeding generations had reached a technology which, without any imagination, defied all possibilities. And there came the time when the descendants flew out into the unending expanses of the universe in round, plate-like flying ships with beam drives. Other solar systems and planets were flown to and expeditioned. New worlds and possibilities opened up in order to transplant the peoples of the home planet, which had meanwhile become too small for the new humankind. The scientists with their spacecrafts and abundantly provided means of all kinds and fantastic application possibilities used the dimension gate known to them to, in another space-time configuration of the Dern universe, reach the Milky Way area and explored the space for ever newer things. They found many new habitable worlds and solar systems, which they often made subservient to themselves using their beam weapons in short, one-sided fights, in order to conquer them for the settlement of their race. However, apart from their horrendous material and gene-based technology, they also perfected their consciousness and their spirit, so that nothing which they wanted to experience remained foreign to them any more. The use of their powers of consciousness became implicitness to them, and so they gradually raised themselves to rulers vis-à-vis -vis their peoples. They called themselves kings of wisdom with the word Ish-Wish, which is on the earth translated as God. Far superior spiritually, and in terms of knowledge as well as consciousness to the normal people, they soon dominated it in evil dictatorial form. Yet after centuries, having grown tired of the godlike scientists, the people rose against them initially in silent revolution. Oppressed, however, by the spiritual and consciousness-based powers and by the tremendous knowledge of the gods, the people had to submit to their rulers. But the will for freedom made them secretly prepare for the fight— it glowed like a smoldering ember for four centuries, to flare up in the given moment as untamable wild conflagration. According to the earthly calculation of time, it was about 230,000 years ago, when the Liberation War broke out. Evil battles covered many planets and much was destroyed. A scientist named Assel used the opportunity to make himself self-reliant and flee. Secretly, he managed to bring a large fleet of spaceships into his possession, to man them and to flee under heavy acts of fighting. With 183 wide bodies and almost 250 reconnaissance ships with a total of 360,000 human beings on board, he fled from his home system. For years, they were restlessly roaming through the expanses of the space before one day they found a solar system that offered them opportunities to live, far away from their home system. It took 300 years after they seized the planet because they created a new humankind. Afterwards, they settled on two more planets of their new home system to then again traverse the outer space while exploring— in doing so, they came across the system of the earthly sun. They settled here on three different planets, namely on the Earth, on Malona, and on Mars, and began with the building of a new culture. But the planets were still rather inhospitable and often hostile. So they left the planets again and paid them visits only now and then. When, then, on the second planet, the Earth, first intelligent life started moving, they came back and lived there. But in accordance with the human beings reflecting, power struggles broke out again, and they left the Earth. 
From the new home planet, however, the development of the Earth was constantly monitored and expeditioned year after year. From time to time it was tried again and again to settle the planet. Also, beings were deported to the Earth, and these were simply left to their fate without any technology and help. They became stunted, wild and bestial. Then finally the time came when the major step was finally ventured. A certain culture was built up on the Earth, which lasted for several millennia. But again, greed for power broke out and everything was destroyed. So the Earth fell again into its old existence. Then it took again several millennia. Before a new attempt was made, this time, however, no more in the sense of an actual expedition. On the home planet, once again, differences of opinion arose, because the scientists again elevated themselves to gods and subjugated the peoples to servitude. From this it resulted that a group of scientists and other human beings who thought differently banded together and seized various spaceships. Almost 70,000 human beings fled and settled on the Earth. Their highest leader, Pelagon, was freely recognized by all as Ishwish God and led a tight regiment. He had nearly 200 sub-leaders, each of whom was responsible for a special field of knowledge. They were, so to speak, sub-gods, or also called guardians. On the home planets, however, war broke out and much was destroyed again. But the human beings finally achieved the freedom and the peace. That has remained so ever since and will also never change again. According to the earthly time calculation, that was around 50,000 years ago. Only on the earth itself things were not always so peaceful, and many mistakes were made. And by one of these mistakes, the primal human races of the earth were procreated, whose descendants still live today and are about to commit the same mistakes as did our ancestors. That is completely fantastic, Simyase. But how did everything go on then? I am looking forward eagerly to it. That I believe you readily, but as for today I cannot tell you any more because my time is up. Next time you shall come to know more.